let's get started. My name is Andy Fox. I'm the director of the Office of Labor Standards. We've got approximately one hour, well, 58 minutes. Uh, the goal today is just give a refresher on the minimum wage in Chicago. Maybe we might touch on a little bit of paid sick leave. Probably don't need to. We might touch the Fair Work Week ordinance. Not a lot. We could discuss briefly the anti-retaliation ordinances. One is for COVID-19, one is for the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started. So um, I'll do a brief introduction, give you an overview, we'll run through some grand, ground rules. I probably just did all three of the first bullets. As, you, as the director of the Office of Labor Standards, my job is to oversee the minimum wage, paid sick leave, fair work week ordinance, and the two other ordinances are anti-retaliation related to COVID-19, anti-retaliation related to the vaccine. So the office was created to protect workers um, in those areas of the law. The city of Chicago's Home Rule Authority, we have you know, established a minimum wage. And in July, each year, there's a new minimum wage. And depending on the size of the employer, or if there are any exceptions, that minimum wage increases, it continues. This year, we've got a group of people who are gonna be making $15 an hour and should be making that now a separate group that might be making $14 an hour. And if for the smallest of the small, like a micro employer, where you have three employees or less, you could pay less than the minimum wage, which would default you to the Illinois Department of Labor website for the state minimum wage. Throughout, I will be talking about the ordinances. And really there's one ordinance. Uh, I should just go ahead and get started. So there's me in a suit. Not wearing a suit today, sorry. I'm out in Ogden and Western. If you want to come visit us or drop off documents, here's where we are. If you want to call me or contact me, you can reach me through BACP Labor Standards at cityofchicago.org. <clears throat> it's down below because I'm speaking fast. And on the weekends, you can find me here riding a bicycle somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Ideally, no cars, very few people, some of my riding uh, geek buddies and I often travel on the weekends to faraway places, particularly the northwest corner of the state of Illinois around Galena, Stockton, Hanover, Elizabeth, beautiful area where the glaciers passed over. Um, <clears throat> so let's get going. Today's webinar is about the minimum wage, which is required for employees and I'll define term the term employee under the ordinance a little later. Now, as we hit July 31st, August 1st, there will be some changes that go into effect to the Chicago minimum wage and paid sick leave ordinance. It's all one minimum wage and paid sick leave uh, that will impact employers. But today is really about just a reminder, minimum wage went up. And how do you, how do you check that? You look at your wage records. And we do this because each year around this time, some employers who don't have a payroll processing company who follows the law or who are small enough that they process their own payroll, pay people less than the minimum wage because they didn't realize it went up. And so a complaint is filed. So we see a spike of complaints related to minimum wage. This is one of the ways the Office of Labor Standards reaches out to people and says, hey, everybody, Time out, check your wage records. Hey, employers, make sure you pay the minimum wage because each day per violation per employee, it could be $500 to $1,000 per violation. If you had 100 employees and there were 100 days, it could be $500 to $1,000 per day per employee. And so it would be a very big violation we're talking about. I'm exaggerating for effect to try to make sure that you don't doze off during my presentation. <laughs> Future webinars, we're going to go into the minimum wage, kind of the, the changes in the paid sick leave ordinance, 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Fair Work Week. That's only for certain industries, certain size employers. Talk about uh, wage theft, which is all new, super important. There's some additional requirements to protect workers that will be implemented. So as needed, we'll do those. And we do it in Spanish and English. Today's in English. If you want to come in three and listen in Spanish, come in three, listen in Spanish. We don't have enough people enrolled. So if you want to, if you're not doing anything, you want to put it on in background music just to check my Spanish language translation, please come and pass it on to friends. Go. Uh, throughout, oh, I didn't set the ground rules. The ground rules are post questions to the chat as you see them. I don't know that I monitor the Q&A, but I will look at the chat as we go. Um, so Hector, I can see that you answered. Now you might not see all the questions, but I'll do is I'll name your first name, not your last, and then do the question. If it's so, if you have questions, try to post questions related to where we're at in the presentation. Some people show up, they want their question answered, and as soon as they get the answer, they're out, which is okay. But I prefer if you ask questions related to the content. Uh, so here we go, and thank you, Elsie. I'll try. Try not to invoke a narcoleptic response in the audience. So what is the minimum wage? The wage is a minimum. It sets the bar. If you are an employer in Chicago uh, and you meet the definition of employer, if you have employees under the statute, which is a term of our employees and covered employees, then you have to pay the minimum wage. The ordinance, and I put it in quotes because it's all one, guarantees accrual and use of paid sick leave. So that's not for today, but there is paid sick leave. Do your covered employees in the state of Chicago, which is basically for every 40 hours they work, they earn one hour up to 40 hours. I'm trying to use the screen. So 40 hours per year, an employee could earn. If they took none of their time by week 40, they could have earned 40 hours. If they work less, than 40 hours a week, like 30 hours, well then they don't earn for one per 40, then you have to do the math. Ideally, you're using a payroll processor and the accrual and rollover of paid sick leave is done by a payroll processor. If you need a spreadsheet to do that, pretty simple. It's a column that establishes for every 40 hours you work or forever, you know, if you work 30 hours one week and 20 another and 28.67 another, then it calculates it based on a column you set up in your spreadsheets. It's not impossible to do. Under um, both employers, both minimum wage, basically, are, there is a prohibition against retaliation. So if someone files a complaint like, oh, my employer is not paying me the full minimum wage, I'm making tips, but I'm not making enough to, to make the full minimum wage. I'm getting $9 an hour, but I only get like a dollar an hour in tips. And I told my employer, and so I'm filing a complaint. The employee complains and you terminate them. That would be retaliation. Any adverse employment action is retaliation. So if you change your dog, you know what? You're not working days, you're working nights. Or you're not working weekends on that overtime shift. If you take away some benefit that they've earned, it could be seen to be an adverse employment action. So if someone exercises rights, don't retaliate. The ordinance allows people to submit complaints to the Office of Labor Standards, and it's easy as calling 311. Some people don't trust 311, but really 311 works. It's an excellent system. It, we get a spreadsheet every morning, and everybody who's called and say, hey, my employer's not paying me full minimum wage, I'm not making enough in tips. We get their name, we get their email, anything they provide to us comes to us the next day. And it should be an employer-focused event. We're not focusing on the work. We're focusing on kind of understanding what happened objectively and determining whether or not we have enough information to go forward. So if it's purely anonymous, we don't have enough information because you're too worried that there's gonna be some retaliation, then we can't pursue it. A restaurant on the west side is not paying the full minimum wage. Okay, could you give us the address? Could you, say, could you provide some wage records? Uh, could you give us more information about the business? We need something enough to investigate. Elsa asks a question, and I know the answer, but I'll read it anyway. If an employer has one employee working in Chicago, but it's located in another state where they have 25 employees, does the employer have to pay one employee working in Chicago 
$15. Well, that is a very specific question. I have to go to the ordinance. I'll pull it up on a separate screen, perhaps share that portion of it. So if you have a thousand employees, but only one working in Chicago, you have to pay them Chicago minimum wage. That's the quick answer, but I'll read from the ordinance so you understand the difference. So yes. Now, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, a question is asked, do you suggest that the employee talk to the employer? I highly recommend that employees talk to employers. We've had several cases with daycare providers, small daycare providers, and um, it turns out that someone just didn't like this July thing. Had someone said, oh, you know, we're not getting paid the minimum wage to the employer. Like, hey, we're supposed to get the minimum wage. No, you're not. We're supposed to get the minimum wage. I called the Office of Labor Standards talking to the director of the webinar yesterday. He said, we need to get the minimum wage effective July 1st. And because we have 21 employees or more, we should be getting $15. The employer was like, that's not true. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm exaggerating for effect. So please take no negative inference from it. But <laughs> employee, then the, some employers who've been caught in this have said, oh man, I had no idea. We we're supposed to be accruing sick leave. Well, that's nice, but you are. And some employers are like, well, then we immediately want to fix it. Upon receiving a subpoena or a phone call or a letter from us, they call us up and I had one. She said, you know what? She wrote in all caps. I think she was writing on her phone and she printed it. She said, I'm really sorry. Here are my employees. Um, tell me what I need to do. And she paid off. It took a little time because we worked with her. And she was a small employer. She had a daycare. And she, she didn't have to let anybody go because of the fines and violations. She cured the defect. What we want to do is make workers whole. So employees, talk to employers, ideally, these things will be rectified. It isn't always the case that the employer wants to pay more, right? Like, hey, I'm supposed to be making more. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> it's a cost. It's a cost of doing business. It's a cost of keeping people happy. It's a cost of allowing people to have a living wage, a fair wage, <laughs> is that the wage goes up along with inflation. You've probably seen the articles about how much food is going up at grocery stores. Grocery stores, according to the news I was watching yesterday, are stockpiling food because inflation is causing meat to rise. All things are going up. Have employee increases matched the inflation? So this is a time of recovery. What you'll hear employers say is, this is a burden on business. How are we going to manage this? We're going to have to lay people off. Well, we're not going to recover on the backs of workers. That should be a response of your worker. If you're an employer, we want to help you come into compliance and appreciate how these things make a stronger economy for all of us. Another question comes in. Are seasonal employees a lot of sick time? Absolutely. We don't, we don't distinguish between part-time, full-time. As I said, if you work 40 hours a week, you accumulate one hour. Now, if I only work 40 hours a month, 10 hours a week, then I would only earn one hour a month. And over the course of 12 months, I would only earn 12 hours of sick leave, but I would still earn. So if the question is, should seasonal em employees be allotted sick time if the seasonal employees file W-2s? If they are 1099 filers, independent contractors, they don't meet the definition of employee. We should probably get to that. We're getting ahead of ourselves. So I'm gonna hold off on some of the questions so I can get into it. Here are the wages. 21 or more, $15 an hour. Four to 20, 14 an hour. One to three, if you have less than four, which is one to three, then the Chicago minimum wage ordinance does not apply. Then you defer to the Illinois uh, minimum wage, which is $11. All domestic workers, all domestic workers, house cleaners, nannies, people who are doing anything that meets the definition of domestic work effective August 1st shall be paid $15 an hour. Now, through progressive reform, we were able to eliminate exceptions. There were many classes of workers that were accepted out. One of the most notable is that people who hire people with disabilities creating a sheltered workshop, um, paying them less than the minimum wage. Just, that was a great idea in the past, but
but we should pay people with disabilities the full minimum wage, shouldn't we? So that has evanesced. That has gone away. And over time, you'll see that that is not immediate, but scheduled out a few years. People who are employing those with disabilities who are paying less than minimum wage will have to pay them the full minimum wage, which is good for people with disabilities. It's good for business. So there are some terms of art. Covered employee and an employer. Minimum wage, general minimum wage, minimum wage for tipped employees, minimum wage for youth workers. When I say terms of art, that means they're in the ordinance. And so if you see a capital C, capital E, you see a capital E for employer, that means, oh, wait a minute, that's a definition. I have to go with the ordinance. Am I an employer? Am I a covered employee? Go to the ordinance. Sometimes, I, I, as a lawyer, which is, I try not to find myself using legalese or terminology of lawyers, but when we interpret the law, it's legal. So for those non-lawyers, welcome to it. Just so you know, if you see a capital C and capital E and covered employees, it's like, wait a minute, do I have covered employees? If they don't meet the definition of covered employees, then we don't reach them in the municipal ordinance. Do I have employees? Employees are those that file with the W-2. Employees are not independent contractors under the Chicago basically minimum wage ordinance. Minimum wage basically minimum wage. Under the minimum wage ordinance, there's the general minimum wage, and there, if you look in the law, there are three tiers, the 21 and up, zero to 20, less than four. And then there are youth workers. There's also the minimum wage for tipped employees. We'll get to that. <clears throat> And there, it's important to note that there are records that have to be retained. So let me, I probably have some slides that are a little more specific than this. So seasonal employees, there was a question about, are seasonal employees allotted sick time? If that seasonal employee files a W-2 and is not an independent contractor, if they, they're covered if in any two week period, they work at least two hours. So do your seasonal employees work at least two hours in two week period? And is the work done in Chicago? They could be covered by the Chicago minimum wage ordinance. There are certain exceptions. If you're an outside salesman, if you're a motor carrier, there's a list of them. If you're a member of a religious corporation or organization, you might be qualified for an exception. We eliminate the exceptions. It should be a fair wage. We shouldn't let business and certain people carve out exceptions in the minimum wage. People are going to eat and live. How are we going to pay their mortgages? How can they participate in society? How can they not be homeless if they don't make a fair wage? Right? That's what the minimum wage ordinance is all about. So an employee is covered if two week period, they work two hours. So let me get some of these questions. Uh, do you use the count for the employer's total count of the company or just employees working in Chicago? Well, that goes back to the count of employees. So minimum wage is created when it's new. I'll get to that in one second in the next slide. But next slide. So I've been talking about the minimum wage. So for large employers, 15, small employers, 14, youth workers, 11. Tipped workers, large tipped workers, or employers that are large, $9. Small employers, $840. Youth are supposed to make $660. But note that if the tipped, if I don't make enough in tips to meet $15 an hour or $14 an hour, the employer has to make up the difference. We had a case. It was an ice cream shop worker in the near west side. He said, uh, I'm, we talked. He said, I told my employer I'm not making minimum wage with tips. There's a tip jar, but no one really tips at the ice cream stand. But the employer's like, that's not my fault. You have to earn a minimum wage. You're not making enough of the tips. Truth is, if a tipped worker doesn't receive the full minimum wage with tips, the employer has to make up the difference, which could mean a violation of the ordinance. It's the truth. And we find that in certain neighborhoods, and particularly women, minority women, African-American and Latinx women 
working in restaurants don't often make the tip wage. And for whatever reason, um, employers don't believe that they have to make up the difference. And so there are those that wish to abolish the tip wage. It's a credit that's given to restaurants and it's, there's a long history of why they do it. Um, oh, the question is, can you repeat which employees should be accruing paid time off? I'll go back to the slide. That's the easiest one. An employee is covered if at any two week period, they work at least two hours while physically present in Chicago. Sick leave is different though. Sick leave has an additional requirement in it. And that in order to meet the definition of sick leave, I'll put it in the chat. Let's see if that posts. Any covered employee who works at least 80 hours for an employer within any 120 day period. So if they're seasonal and they don't work more than 80 hours in that seasonal period, then they wouldn't be qualified. Most people work 80 hours. But if you hire them for two weeks, well, but then it's the whole year. Ideally, or in a perfect world, they would cross that threshold to 80. They've got to work two in a two week period, at least two hours while physically present. It's really physical presence in two hours. They would accrue, but the accrual is for every 40 hours, one hour of sick leave. So if they're working five hours a week, or wait, if they're only working four weeks, but they're working 40 hours, that's four hours of sick leave. And that goes in the bank for them. And if they come back, they could draw on that bank of sick time. Youth, there's a question, what age would you consider youth workers? Juveniles, an adult is 18, a juvenile is 17. Uh, question for clarification, 1099 employees are not covered under the Chicago minimum wage, but are covered under the Illinois minimum wage. That is correct. Independent contractors might be misclassified, but temporary workers, seasonal workers, there's the, um, I think it's the Illinois Temporary and Seasonal Worker Act. You would go to the Illinois Department of Labor for information on, on kind of if you're using temporary workers or seasonal workers, I would refer you to the Illinois Department of Labor for kind of the conditions of employment. And there are conditions that need to be uh, complied with under the uh, state law. Well, you all are keeping me quite busy. I'm having a hard time advancing because the questions are fast and furious. So another question comes in. What time period for making up the difference? It's supposed to appear in the next paycheck. So the question relates to tips. So the person says, I'm not making enough in tips. Well, if they don't inform you, it's kind of hard for you to pay that back. But if you make a good faith effort, it's supposed to appear in the next paycheck. So if they're doing it with credit card and they're not making that amount, they probably say, listen, I'm not making enough. Then you kind of have to work with them to establish a way to pay it back. If you missed the current pay period and it came back the next, I think we would be pretty reasonable about it. And I don't think they would have to be in a position to complain about it. But that would require some effort. Um, you're supposed to pay the next, pay is supposed to show up the next pay period. So if you pay every seven days, it's supposed to, the next paycheck would be where it should show up. If they don't inform you that they didn't make enough and you don't have a method for monitoring that, then the following paycheck. If you make them whole, uh, it, it kind of takes away the case for it. Oh, here's a good question regarding tips. What time period for making up a difference? Example, they work Wednesday and Saturday. On Wednesday, they don't make enough in tips. But on Saturday, they may make more than enough to cover Wednesday and Saturday. Do they need to make up the difference on Wednesday? Well, I look to the whole pay period. Really? So, um, some of both. I, I would look at the pay period to determine on the pay stub, what was the hourly rate? Did they make enough per hour in this pay period to meet the minimum wage? Maybe somebody had a bad day. You, it's, it's not recommended. If, if they're moving to like from server to cashier or like 
the greeter, whatever the greeter position is, then um, you want to make sure that your pay records reflect the different pay amounts. Like maybe as a server, they're making a tip credit, but when they're working as a bar back or a cashier, there's a different rate of pay. Try to make sure that the payroll shows those different hourly amounts. I know that sounds like work, but so be it. And it, it will be made up on the pay period, not pay day, not per shift. In my humble estimation. I'm really glad you all are asking questions because I can't imagine listening to me as anything uh, as nearly as exciting as your questions are. All right, so overtime. Overtime, effective July 1st, 2021, 2250 for the large employers. Overtime. Tip to minimum wage is calculated differently. We've got a different, it's, it's a different sort of math. I'll just post it here. Large employers, it's nine. Small, it's 840. Use 660. Tipped workers and overtime, their tipped credit amount should be 1650. The small employers, 1540. Youth employers, 1210. Sharon, we will post the, uh, Sharon asked if we could share the slides. We'll post the whole thing. We don't share the slides, but we'll post the entire uh, webinar so that you can have it that way, if that helps. There is a question about, you know, this is the paid sick leave presentation, but regarding paid sick leave, one of the things that people misapprehend is that, for example, in that daycare that had some issues, they were trying to fix them, they were not giving their employees um, sick leave until finishing the whole year of employment. The statute requires that people must be able to exit no longer than, a, no less than 180 days. So at the 180 day mark, you can't say you can't access sick leave until 180 days. They have to be able to access it at the longest 180 days out. So you have to give them access. You can't say you can't access your sick leave further out than 180 days. That would be a violation. People have to access their sick leave. So. That's important. So here is a copy of the minimum wage paid sick leave notice. This is the new one. If you go to our website, type in Office of Labor Standards Chicago, you'll be able to download the website, uh, the actual, this thing on the right hand, or to your eyes, to the right hand side. Yes, depending on your computer works. And those, those are the icons we use, the dollar sign in red, the uh, cross is for paid sick leave. And so this is the full public notice that should be posted on your premises. If investigators are out there looking at a public health violation or some other violation, and they see that there's no notice, you could be issued a, uh, a violation for failure to display the public notice. So display it. Note that each year, July at or near July 1st, employees should be getting the new public notice. Now, why do we do that? It seems burdensome. What it does is it reminds employees, hey, you're supposed to get minimum wage increase. It reminds payroll people in the payroll or HR offices. We distribute this thing because, oh crap, we've got a minimum wage increase. We see a spike in claims related to sick, uh, sick leave and minimum wage, because each year people forget that there's a new cycle. We had a very prominent uh, bar and restaurant in the Wrigley area. People were making the minimum wage, but they were making far and exceed in excess of it based on tips, but not based on the tip credit they were doing. The payroll processor didn't roll over to the new amount. So they were supposed to be paying 840, they were paying like 810, and they hadn't done it for a couple of years. So each July, it was like July, August, September. So weeks of not getting the full tip credit to the employees resulted in a very large violation. Large, large depends on how large, large is. I think it was like five to $7,000 that we recouped 
and was repaid to those employees. It doesn't seem like much, but over the course of three years, each year for a couple of weeks, you're not making the full minimum wage or you're not making the tip credit, it adds up. You're putting in a 40 hour shift, they're paying you 810 as opposed to 840, and it's eight weeks over the course of three years, it adds up. It adds up to five to $7,000. It adds up to a significant violation on behalf of the employer. And they admitted it was wrong. They were really upset with the payroll processor who did not calculate in the changes to minimum wage. And check your pay stubs to make sure that paid sick leave is displayed to employees. If you're not seeing it on your wage records, where is it? Do employees know what their sick leave accruals are? For the person who asked about seasonal employees, let's say they're W-2 filers, they work maybe 80 hours over the course of two months, and July and August, they work 80 hours, they should see paid sick leave accruals. And they should be able to take days off and get paid. So if they take a day off and don't get paid, violation. If, they're not, if they don't know what sick leave they have, do they really have it? A uh, question regarding youth workers subject to less than 650 hours per year, like the state. Our, the youth minimum wage is here. It's on this. Youth minimum wage is $11 an hour in the city of Chicago. That's the minimum wage. I don't know that they have to cross a threshold for hours worked. You could refer to the state, uh, state of Illinois for that. We have home rule authority. We've mandated that youth workers shall be paid $11 an hour. And a question from a state agency based in the city of Chicago. Um, governmental entities do not have to pay the Chicago minimum wage. It's an exception to the rule. I'll read it to you as well, either at an accredited Illinois college or university where the covered employee is a student, accepted out from the minimum wage for any governmental entity other than the city of Chicago and its sister agencies. So if you are a governmental entity employing people in the city of Chicago, you are not subject to the Chicago minimum wage. And you can leave that. Just kidding. Um, there is a question, Chad, you put your question to me privately but I'll post it, um, put it to all when you post it in. Is it illegal to pay cash? It's, I don't think it's illegal. I'd have to refer to the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act. If you pay, pay cash, how are you deducting from their salaries? So there should be state law deductions. Here's how it works. Um, the city is not interested in immigration status of workers. We had a case with the local taqueria and restaurant. There were some workers who were paid in cash. We're not interested in their immigration status. They made a complaint. Now, yes, you should not pay cash because in essence, you're violating the ordinance because you're not deducting things. However, that's not how we would seek enforcement. We would seek to understand whether or not people shall, uh, the deductions are made. And we want to make sure the workers are paid the minimum wage. In the case we had, they were not, he was paying uh, minimum wage in check for regular hours for overtime. He was not paying overtime. He was paying in cash. He felt that it was benefiting his workers, but he wasn't paying the overtime rate. He was paying the minimum wage rate. So um, I'd have to, I have to look at the Wage Payment Collection Act. It's not encouraged that you pay in cash, but, and so how do you keep records? You are required to retain records under the ordinance. So if you're paying cash, you have to keep records. If people report that I was paid in cash, like let's say workers who are educated, keep a notebook or they deposit the cash that they're paid. And let's say they're undocumented and they don't have any paperwork. If they have no paperwork, we could determine that they're employees and treat them as W-2s. So someone who's not, doesn't have any paperwork, is paid in cash. We determine that they weren't paid the minimum wage. You have to make them whole because you're supposed to pay them minimum wage. Deductions should be made, but in this case, because we're not interested in um, immigration status, 
we would recommend that you keep some records. If there are no records retained as to the amounts paid, deductions that were made, there could be a violation for that. Our goal was to make the workers whole. So if a worker were to complain that they were paid, that they were paid in cash, we would subpoena the records from the employer. If there were no records, we would look at the records from the employees and create a rebuttable presumption. We would rely on the information, the notes, the text, the deposit slips of the workers and turn to the employer and say, hey, employer, we have information that shows that workers were paid in cash and they were paid less than the minimum wage. Produce records to establish the rates that they were paid and the amounts they were paid and the hours they worked and so on. If you don't have records, then we will rely on the records that were given to us by the workers. So to your question, how do we keep cash payment on record? Keep a record. You create records. Discourage paying people in cash. Because how do you deduct for state and federal taxes? All right. So that's my answer to that. Sorry, I went on a mini tangent. Can the vacation days be classified as part of sick days for the total days needed? Well, if Tony asks, if their vacation days are vacation days, if they're sick days are sick days, they're separate. Vacation days are benefits. It involves if a person leaves and is accrued vacation days, they can cash them out. If a person earns sick leave, they can't under the statute cash those out. They can retain those sick leave days. So how you form your policies and procedures is up to you. Could you create a policy for a paid time off umbrella and under it have vacation, sick, and personal? Yes. How do you distinguish among each? Do you, you know, it, it either is sick leave or it isn't. If you call it time off and you credit people with time off, I mean, you don't have to give them benefit of vacation at all. That's a benefit. If you call it time off and you're not interested, if it's you have to produce a doctor's note, you take your time off when you earn it, that's up to you. That's an area that is hotly contested right now. So I'd be, I would seek counsel on that, Tony, before you made any substantive changes to it. A question comes in. <clears throat> you guys are asking the best questions. Guys and gals, you people are asking. Or my people, who would who would else be in attendance? Dogs, possibly. Dogs could be watching this and chiming along. Could you repeat what you said about the 180 days? So I'm going to put it in. I'm going to find the section of the ordinance. Use of paid sick leave. This is long, so brace yourself. This is paid sick leave. This is not a this is not a webinar on paid sick leave, but I will indulge you because you're here. And I'm reading from the chat. Feel free to join me there. An employer shall allow a covered employee to begin using paid sick leave no later than on the 180th day. So People have to be able to use sick leave, but you don't have to let them use it right away. It can be no later than 180 days. Now, I know the person who wrote the ordinance, and that person sometimes overcomplicates things. Basically, this applies. You can't say, hey, listen, you're not going to use sick leave until you reach a year of employment. So we're going to require you can use sick leave starting on day 120 of your employment. How many days is 120? Four times three. I'm an attorney, right? So math is not my thing. After four months of employment, you can use sick leave. Oh, okay. That's not 180 days. Yeah. It's not 180 days. It's short of 180 days. It's four months. You can't say six months. Six times three is 100. Oh, could be six months. Once you hit your six month anniversary at our fine establishment, you can use sick leave, but it can't be after that. What this does is it allows employers, you don't want people like cashing it out who just started. So you require them to accrue up to a certain point and they get it on the books. And some people might not accrue as fast. If I'm only working 10 hours a week and you're working 40, 
by day 160 or 80 or 20, whatever, I would accrue a lot less sick time. So if I try to take off eight hours and I don't have eight hours, I'm taking off eight hours. If I have to quarantine, I'm sick. If I have to isolate, I might only be able to use two hours I've earned because I've only earned two hours. Now, the other hours, you can say, listen, I'm going to give you the two hours. But you can take this time off, but I'm not going to pay you. You haven't earned any time to take off. Um, sick leave, here's a really good question. Who are you people? I love your questions. <laughs> if an employee leaves without using any of their accrued sick time, do they have to pay it out? Under the ordinance, we should do a separate one on paid sick leave. Under the ordinance, um, an employer does not have to pay out sick leave if a person leaves. Vacation leave, there is a specific area of the law in the Illinois compiled statutes that requires you to pay out vacation leave to turn. Sick leave, no. Sorry, you do not have to pay that time out. Keep it on the books, maybe they'll come back. But you don't have to pay it out. That was my spiel on the minimum wage ordinance. Let's see what else we have. So there's an anti-retaliation ordinance. Let me see if I missed any other questions. I hope I'm missing them because you asked the best questions. Question from Robin. I own a food truck and I paid my employees, two of them, in cash, but I keep a record through Zelle. Oh, you've got a record. You just said you have a record. But let me make sure. I think the question is under the record keeping requirements of minimum wage ordinance, are you violating the law? You're supposed to pay people and make deductions though. So the question to Robin would be, are those W-2 employees or are they independent contractors? That would determine whether or not we can even reach them for purposes of the ordinance. I think in the area of minimum wage, paid sick leave rules, we talk about the records that must be retained. I'm going to go there. Um, where are my rules? Oh, darn it. Come on. My computer's really slow today. So under the rules, minimum wage and basic leave rules that you can find on our website, uh, notice of posting, contents of records, employers must maintain at a minimum the following records for covered employees. So if those are W-2 filers, um, food cart person, I love food carts, I'm just going to say it. I mean, as much as I like riding bikes, I like food. I live in Pilsen, so anything Pilsen related, food. And I work near kind of the West End, Tri Taylor, Little Italy. If it's food, I'm in. You must retain records for five years and make such records available upon inspection. So if you have these records, you're fine. If not, name of covered employee, mailing address, telephone, email address for each covered employee, occupations and job titles for covered employees, hire date of covered employees, date each person was eligible for paid sick leave, number of hours paid sick leave accrued. Date number of hours each covered employee using paid sick leave, rate and pay of covered employees, hours worked each day, type of payment, straight time, overtime pay, total wages, additions and deductions of covered employee wages for each pay period, and explanation of additions and deductions, dates of payment. So you would comply with almost all of those. It doesn't sound like you're deducting. So question is, if you're paying in cash, is that something that the Illinois Department of Employment Security would be interested in? Because you have to keep payroll records, no, under the Unemployment Insurance Act. It, and I, I used to work there, but I'm not an agent, I'm not a delegate, I don't speak on their behalf. This is not legal advice. <laughs> you should be paying payroll taxes because if they are employees and they get laid off, if they're let go, if they're furloughed, they might be due unemployment insurance. Watch your payroll. That could be interesting. Now, the question as a follow-up to one of my previous ones, if, a, if an employee comes back within the same year, 
can the sick time be zeroed out? Currently, yes. Yes. Sick leave shall be, uh, if a person is laid off, furloughed, let go, and they come back at the discretion of the employer, they could be granted that sick time. However, that is a loophole, especially during the pandemic. So we've eliminated that going forward. So effective August 1st, and we'll go into that in a further webinar, not that you want to tolerate me for another webinar. And at the discretion of the, <laughs> the employer now, you don't, you, you don't have to credit them. Effective August 1st going forward, if they were to let go, furlough, whatever, if another pandemic hit, if they get sick or whatever, you downsize, you would close by order of public health or the Illinois Department of Public Health or the mayor, the governor, whoever, the president. Then when they were rehired, they could access that sick leave that they've earned. Right now, it's at your discretion. A good employer would allow them to have it. Right now, it's at your discretion. Retaliation. Retaliation is any adverse action. Just think of that. The anti-retaliation ordinance for COVID-19. If a person obeys an order issued by the mayor, or governor, Chicago Department of Public Health, health provider to stay at home from work due to COVID-19 related reason, you can't let them go. So they burned all their sick leave. They got none. Or they're told this, they're told to quarantine for two weeks. And they've only got one week, they've got 40 hours on the books. That second week, notice how I use the screen there. The second week, you can't let them go because it was like a no call, no show. They've got COVID-19. Now they have to inform you. We've seen some wily employees attempt to game the system. And all of a sudden, it's an attendance violation, it's attendance, and they say, no, 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 I had COVID-19. Well, do you have any records? No. Do you have any records? No. I want to see that. It's kind of that employee. This is, I was at a doctor, but you can't produce it. So. Be sensitive to it. Employees are valuable. Employees keep the business running. Employees, you invested in training them and getting them up to speed and creating a team that embraces them. But some employees try to gain the system. We want to empower employers to, to use corrective measures to deal with employees. But you can't retaliate against those that if you're supposed to stay home, stay home. If a doctor tells you stay at home, well, my employer said I have fire, so I went to work and I, I got everybody sick. We don't want employees coming to work who were sick because the manager told them you got to be here on fire. Day. Right? I mean, that makes sense. There is some common sense built into the law and application of the law. And we try to use a little common sense when we apply these laws to the employer employee relationship. So, here is the infographic for the anti-retaliation ordinance. And the number one really applies to early uh, during the pandemic that people, what time is it? What time is it? Uh, stay at home to minimize training. Everybody was told to stay at home. And then they came up with, and so we all stayed at home. And it was great because I was essentially riding my bicycle. I'm an essential bike rider. I was essential work riding my bicycle. Whatever, I'm exaggerating for a fact. However, essential workers, we're allowed to move around. And so then that became, am I essential, am I not essential? And all the businesses wanted to stay open because they believe they were essential. So we had this panel of employees and we received all the 311 calls about all these people that were complaining, like my employer's telling me I have to show up to work. And I don't think the dog grooming business is essential. And the dog grooming business is over oh, essential. We are absolutely essential. And I remember one craft store who had multiple locations told its workers we're essential, come to work or we're gonna fire you. This is like the height of the pandemic when it was just growing. So I called up the craft store with multiple locations. And I said, so do you believe that your operations are essential? Yes, because we sell things that can be used for making masks. So I recited to them the Illinois uh, executive order from Governor Pritzker, the uh, executive order or whatever the mandate from the mayor the city of Chicago, it was either mayor or Dr. Arwadi, and said, I'm reading through the essential, and the essential governmental functions were kind of tra um, infrastructure, hospitals. I mean, think of early in pandemic. And it, they didn't meet the definition. So the manager was very gruff and tough with me. No, no, no. Next day, when I went to call back, 
Turns out on the website, they had closed all six locations. We were trying to protect people. Those days are gone. Now we're in a whole different phase. However, so if someone is experiencing COVID-19, stay at home. Treating healthcare providers is you've got COVID symptoms, stay at home. If you've been told to quarantine, if you've been told to isolate, uh, you need to stay at home. So stay at home. You can't discipline them during that period of time because there are no call, no show. They have to inform you what's going on. And early on, and right now under the ordinance, people have to, you can require certification at day three. Day three that you're out, you need to provide some certification. Early in the pandemic, doctors said, no, don't even come to the doctor's office. Now you can go to the doctor's office. You can communicate with your doctor's office very differently than you used to. You can require certification. A lot of employers who want to keep people said, listen, you can self-certify. Just tell us what's going on and then firm that up with your doctor later. But for right now, stay at home. Don't bring us stuff to work, please. All right, so we also, this is in Spanish, I'm sorry, I didn't update my presentation. If you want to come in three and see this in Spanish, please do. The infographic uh, explains kind of, well, it's in English, but the top is in Spanish. All right, it's about vaccine anti-retaliation. Not that this is at the apogee of effect right now, but some employers didn't want to let people take the vaccine, so this encouraged people, hey, if someone, gets a vaccine or has a, an appointment to get a vaccine, let them travel to get the vaccine. So we allowed an employer may not require a worker to be vaccinated during off shift hours. So you must get vaccinated to work here. Okay, well, I got an appointment today at nine. No, 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 you can't, you can't go during work hours. You have to go during your own hours. So if you're gonna require people to go during work hours, you have to pay them that time to and from the vaccine appointment. And you can monitor that time if you're the employer, so it's right across the street, like you can't take four hours to go across the street, get a 10 a.m. appointment. I mean, it's reasonable that it's from nine to 11, maybe depending on the lines. But if you live in Rogers Park on the north side and your vaccine appointment's down on the commercial, down by the Skyway, you might need more than two hours to get it done. So we allot up to four hours for travel that you should pay. An employer cannot retaliate against a worker for taking time during a shift to get a vaccine. That's the bottom line. You can't retaliate against someone who's getting the vaccine. It's good public health policy, right? You know, and you want people to get vaccinated. Most employers get this and did it, and they some people even pay people to get it. We should be paying more people to get the vaccine. Get the vaccine early. But there are those that are participating. I think the lottery drawing for those, if you're not vaccinated right now, I'm not interested in your status. I think there's still a chance to get in that million dollar lottery. You provide some proof that you got vaccinated, you get vaccinated through the state, whatever. There's a lottery. Bring it on. If you're looking for this information and you want to give it to people, it's at chicago.gov forward slash labor standards. So who's protected? Most employees who work at least two hours in a two week period are protected by the entire retaliation ordinance. Same employees guaranteed the minimum wage and the minimum wage benefits. So our office is pretty simple. If you have a complaint, you call 311. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'd like to make a complaint. What is it? Paid sick leave violation. Really? Where do you work? Here. Here's the address. What's your name? What's your address? The Office of Labor Standards does not call the employer and say, Andy, just complain that you're not giving them sick leave. The office keeps confidential the complainant. If you wish to designate someone as your representative and keep some portions anonymous, you can. But if you don't give us enough information, do an anonymous complaint to investigate it, it's not gonna get investigated. So, however, you do give us your information. We keep that confidential and our process is a complaint has been made once we determine that we got enough evidence to go forward with the subpoena. We issue a subpoena gathering information as to all the employees, not just the one. Because if it's happening to one, odds are it's happening to many. And during the course of that investigation, when we learn names and addresses and phone numbers of others, we will contact names and addresses of other people to firm up the allegations. 
and we do it objectively. Sometimes a disgruntled employee, and this is the way most employers, we're a really family-run restaurant. This is really shocking to us. We had no idea that anyone was anything but upset. They should have come to us. Great, great, great. But we've gathered the evidence, and we have your wage records, and you've never given them paid sick leave. Family run. And well, no one's ever said anything. Well, is it their duty to inform you that you're violating the law? Maybe they're scared to be the one to complain to you. They complained to us. We investigated it. Unless you prove to us that you've got paid sick leave that's been given to employees, there's a policy and a handbook. That there's forms that are initiated to allow people to take time. We see on the wage records might be a violation. Wage wage theft is rampant. People are constantly stealing wages from workers. In some of the most complex fast food restaurants, managers have the ability to make, make and change schedules. So you work 40 hours, all of a sudden you see on your pay 30 hours. That's a violation. That's a form of wage theft. And that's where we're going with the August 1st amendments to wage theft. Drum roll, please. August 1st is a substantial amendment to the law to protect workers. And good employers love a good compliance moment because they're paying the full minimum wage. They're paying paid sick leave. It's a cost of business. They're fine with that. We'll make do. Whereas these other unsavories are gaming the system, doing black market payments, and getting away with gaming the system. We want to root out those things. Uh, Question from Samira, if you have less than three employees, the minimum wage defers to the state of Illinois, and in the state of Illinois right now, the minimum wage is $11. Uh, I don't have all these little charts on my office. I don't want to show you how messy my wall is, but usually I keep these things about minimum wage up and running. So if you want to call 311, the operator can take that call and comes to us. If you want to use the Shy 311 app, it comes into us. We don't we don't identify complainants. We review the complaint. We try to figure out do we have enough information to issue a subpoena? We issue a subpoena, we do it for all employees, not just the one. Usually it's a pattern. And we look at the records to see whether or not the complaint bears fruit. Retaliation cases are sticky and tricky. And they're layered, and sometimes there's personal animus on both sides. If you have questions about that, visit our website, chicago.gov forward slash labor standards. Oh, wow, we're at the 59 minute mark. Well, here's our complaint form. Pretty straight ahead. We identify the business first. What's your complaint? You narrate it, or the employee would narrate it for us. And then we identify the complaint. We try to put the burden. We focus on the employer. We ask the complainant information. Uh, this is just like a summary intake document. We would follow up uh, with much more detail. So effective August 1st, we're going to be looking at wage theft. We're going to close a loophole. We're going to work on paid sick leave. We're going to be talking about domestic workers moving up to tier one, $15 an hour. On our website, this webinar, uh, where we posted there, we don't post the actual deck. Um, so, does anyone have any further questions? If you have specific, some people just don't like posting questions in this kind of format. If you have questions that were not answered, if you didn't have time to ask a question, if you, on reflection, would like to ask a more specific question, send it to BACP Labor Standards, City of Chicago.org. Our three stellar investigators, Roderick, Khadijah, Marsha, and or the law clerks, I won't name them, but yeah, well. Yohan and Katya, if it's a pretty straight ahead question, they'll answer them. If it's convoluted and tricky, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll reach consensus as a group and answer your questions. All right, so um, the full link to the ordinance. Oh, buddy. Before I go, I'll try to post the ordinance link. OLS, wage ordinance. I have the link to the ordinance. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I will post uh, someone asked that I post the actual ordinance. I don't see the link to the ordinance. 
it should be somewhere on this page. It's down at the bottom of this page, but I'll post it now. So I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and your awesome questions. Just saying, some of the best questions I've seen in a while. Um, you're free to go. Uh, feel free to send any questions to me. You just put Andy in your email, like, hey, Andy, just so you know, I'd like to correct something you said. I've received emails correcting some of the things I've said. If you have questions, issues, or concerns, send them to that email. And if it's um, if they can't answer that, I will help out. So that's all I have. Um, thank you all for attending. And uh, if you want to see the same thing in Spanish, a little less vim and vigor, comment three. So talk to you soon and sign up for the other one if you're interested in real.